Hey everybody, trust you are well, can't believe it's uh, 10 weeks this week since the last time that we met at uh, Q. Of course, that will have been the same for uh, um, most people in this country, probably nine weeks because we, we uh, cut out a week earlier. Uh, a little different across the world, but nevertheless, it's been a long time. Um, and uh, I hope you are holding up under all of this and that... Uh, uh, when it does change, which might be not until July, that you will uh, come back and be with us and help us to move forward as a community, please, please. Also, thank you for those of you, as we are not able to meet, who have taken the time to uh, just give a little feedback, a little, a little hello uh, for what's being um, served out each time I talk to you. I greatly appreciate that. It encourages me. Because I've said to you before, it it's uh, it's um, a very different thing sat sat talking to yourself in the screen of a cell phone than uh, seeing you all face to face in a building and feeling the atmosphere that's there. So thank you for for those encouragements. Keep them coming uh, if it's any good. That is, if it's helping you, keep them coming. Uh, also um, appreciate that that we are able to. Um, uh, get what we're saying across the world to others and people that we love and so a big shout out today to uh, uh, Graham and Eileen and Grant in um, in uh, New Zealand we love you guys we really miss you um, but glad that uh, the miles don't uh, keep us apart from from our heart connection and uh, that's greatly appreciated uh, also to a friend of mine who I've grown to love and care about Dave Taylor in uh, in uh, Waco, Texas. Hi, Dave. Appreciate you as well and uh, and you're taking the time to listen to us. And also to two of our more recent um, friends, uh, Mike and Kathy Romero in Murray, Utah. We love you guys. Looking forward to seeing you again when, when hopefully we manage to get back to Salt Lake to con continue that journey. So love to you guys and love to everybody at Murray Baptist uh, this week. Um, I want to talk to you about John the Baptist. Now, you might think, why should I be interested in John the Baptist? Well, you should, uh, because his story speaks to all of us about how we respond to the challenge to change. Uh, how even with the greatest of insights, we can get stuck in a rut of our own making. I'd preach this a certain way if I was entirely speaking to a church um, or a churched audience, but I'm aware that I'm not. So I am trying to temper and work the thing so that it appeals to a wider uh, group of people so that uh, none of you feel left behind or left apart uh, by this because either it gets too too religious or too non-religious. Um, uh, hopefully it will be neither and it will just be uh, a heartfelt expression of of relationship and humanity that we can share together and come to a place of truth. Um, John became a prime example of how we can become stuck in, in, in our own groove until it becomes a rut and then then it becomes our grave. Uh, I'm sure we're all familiar with and have maybe at times used the exact phrase or at least thought thoughts that would be along this avenue about uh, just feeling that you're stuck in a rut, that your life is in a rut. Um, ruts are made when the same piece of ground is, is passed over continually uh, with no variation and then it begins to wear away that piece of ground and uh, it's not something that one sets out to do but it's something that invariably happens if we think down the same uh, avenues of thought if we live by repetitive models in life then invariably they will create ruts within our thinking and our experience uh, that often often we do not recognise until they've actually become ruts. And then when we want to see change, when we want to diversify, we find it extremely difficult because now our wheels are stuck in the rut, if you know what I mean. We witnessed that uh, firsthand 
uh, when we lived in uh, in Nebraska in in the 80s, right on the Oregon and Mormon trails, where you can still witness the the uh, the ruts of the wagons that went through on their pioneering journey of discovery. Uh, for some people, it was fresh ground. For others, once you got in that rut, uh, others had kind of decided where you were going. And uh, that can often be the case in life that we, we want to set out as who we are to find our way, but we find ourselves uh, in the same ruts that others have made before us. And I want you to be free uh, from that. That's why what I want to talk about, I think, is a great uh, illustration of, of breaking out of that. Um, you know, and the rut can become our grave. Uh, and the deeper the rut we create, uh, the, the harder it becomes to climb out. Uh, big shout out as well while we're at it to Terry and Pam Carrier in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, who know exactly what I'm talking about with the ruts. The deeper the rut we create, the, the harder it becomes to climb out. The, the more we walk the path of that rut, the deeper it gets. But what's crazy is that um, even though we know we're in a rut, uh, uh, whether that's a personal rut, a family rut, or or a church rut, uh, we defend our ruts as if they were wartime trenches hiding us from the threat of an enemy. Ain't nobody going to uh, going to get us out of our rut. We took time to make this rut. Uh, do you know what I mean? Um, and we tend to see we tend to see them as walls of protection rather than walls of imprisonment that become the grave in which all we could have been becomes buried. Uh, in today's terms, I would describe John the Baptist as a bohemian hippie type. Uh, sandal wearing, bug eating. Apparently one of his, uh, his favourite snacks was uh, locusts and wild honey. Long haired, camel skin wearing, alcohol free. Now I want to say pot smoking protester but but uh, but let's just say protester because I think the other aspect of it might get me into a lot of trouble with some of you so let's just call him a protester but you know the kind of character uh, that I'm talking about. A little obscure, a little different and probably needed to be that to do what he did but that that itself did not protect him from the challenges and the dangers of, uh, of, of what was happening in, in his perception of what was expected of him uh, in his life and what he wanted to protect. So ask most Christians what was John's message and uh, they're likely to come up with this answer and I've tested this. Oh, oh John preached repentance. Now, if, if it was, if that was his message, I, I would... I would differ a little on that, but if it was his message, that certainly mean does not mean uh, what most of the evangelical community think it means. Um, where people quote from is, you know, Matthew 3, verse 1 through 3, it says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Um, that's that's what he did now. Of course, this idea of repentance, we, we have developed the idea, well, personally, uh, repentance was this deep um, emotional thing that, that had to flow from within, uh, accompanied by blubbing and snotting and begging and, uh, and, and fretting and being sorrowful and, and um, uh, beating yourself up over how awful you were, how terrible you'd been towards God. And, you know, if only God could find just in his heart the mercy to save you, because now you were genuinely, incredibly distraught about your own condition. Well, whatever that may be and whether that may be helpful to some people, that is not what the Bible means about repentance. And if John did come preaching repentance, that was not the kind of repentance that he should have preached or was supposed to preach. That may have changed a little later. I'll talk about that in the next talk. Um, because this whole idea of what John was sent to do was to straighten the path, not the person. 
where Christianity particularly has unfortunately fallen into a rut of thinking it's about straightening the person and not the path. About straightening out the person to come to God rather than straightening out the path where God simply is able very simply and easily to come and show up and, and uh, express himself, itself, that self within the within the life and experience of 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 this human this human person that um, that we are reaching out to in in the greek the word repentance is the word metanoia and a metanoia has got nothing to do with blubbing and sobbing and coming to an altar and begging for forgiveness uh, metanoia is to do with a change of mind it means to totally turn around to change your mind to shift your thinking uh, to a receptive mode and um, and so when when we talk about if John was preaching repent for the kingdom of heaven and his hand he was saying if you don't change your mind if you don't shift your thinking you are not going to be able to find understand experience what we mean by the kingdom of God by the expression of of heaven breaking into earth and in your life so here's what it says about uh, John. I want to read you something from, from the book of Isaiah. This, this is what he was supposed to be doing. First three of Isaiah chapter 40. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. It wasn't about how people got to God it was about how you made a way so that very smoothly and easily God could emerge, be seen, experienced and encountered by the people. Make, make a straight road in the wilderness. The wilderness always speaks of the barren place in our life. Make, make a road through the barren place in people's lives so that they can see and experience the presence of God. Uh, he said, every valley shall be raised up and every mountain and hill made low. In other words, our job, my job, is to, is, to, is to fill the holes, fill the gaps, to bring it up and, and to tear down all the high-minded stuff, the mountain stuff that, that are obstacles that get in the way. In other words, you've heard the term level playing field. To level out the playing field so that... Um, so that the real God, the true God, not the imagined God of so much religious perspective, not the reconstructed God that often happens, particularly within my own stream in evangelicalism, uh, but the, the God, the creator, the source, the loving one, the gracious one, so that he at least comes to our lives on a level playing field, not interrupted and disrupted by false concepts, of who we think God is according to our medieval um, artistic ideas or our empirical interpretations of biblical truth or our weak uh, grabs for power and identity. We have to release God to being the loving creator who cares, who is involved and who's here and who's available to all, in all and with all. Um, so we're supposed to do that. Um, uh, and the crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places smooth. So we're supposed to straighten out the, the conversation. Straighten it. Don't complicate it. Get, get all the crooked bits out of it. And make it straight. And uh, make the rough bits smooth. Smooth it all over. Why? Because it should be easy for God to come to people. However you want to define uh, the full essence of the God who is love, it should be easy for him to come to people. And I think sometimes we have made it hard for people to find the ability or the willingness or the desire to give accessibility uh, to this God that I'm talking about, this, this creator, this, this, this great source of all things. Uh, because we have complicated it or made them feel a certain way, but we're supposed to get the crooked places straight and the rough places smooth. And it says, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed when we do that. So, so if we if we make make straight paths in the desert of people's lives, make it a highway, uh, fill in the gaps, bring down the high places, make it level, 
straighten stuff out, make it smooth, make the path straight and straightforward. Uh, then he says the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And I love this. And all mankind together, right? Not just a few, not some. All mankind together will see it for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. So that's that's what John was sent to do. So any any distorted view of maybe John distorted it of of this repentance uh, being about straightening people out uh, rather than straightening the path to people um, was a misrepresentation. Uh, what we've just talked about is the is the real essence of what he was sent to do. So Matthew chapter 11 in the New Testament uh, verses 1 through 15 introduces to, to John, a John who is now in prison. Okay, this is John the Baptist is now in prison. He's disillusioned, he's offended, he's discontented and questioning everything, even those things that he thought to be true and of which he seemed certain. That might be some of your spiritual journey. Maybe you're afraid to actually say that because you think your church buddies will uh, will think less of you. But I know more of you have been there and are there than, than ever gets uh, admitted or acknowledged. Uh, so this is John and, and this is where it comes from. Okay, so let me read you these few verses. Matthew 11, uh, let me just read to verse 6. After, after Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples... He went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. When John heard in prison what Christ was doing, so there's John in prison, hearing what Christ is doing, John sent his disciples, so John had disciples, we'll talk about that in the week, uh, to ask him, uh, Christ, Jesus, are you the one who was to come or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured. The deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Now get this, I'm, I'm going to quote this verse from the New King James Version. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Now, why would you put that in? And I'm going to show you next time there is a reason for that being there. Why would you... Put that in if it was not an important point that we need to grasp that that with all that he had experienced and seen, he had now come to the point where he was actually, the, the, the verse suggests, offended at or because of Jesus. Jesus had not become in his eyes the one who he thought Jesus would become and should have become, and he found it now very difficult to embrace the true Jesus, the true Christ, and uh, all that he had come and brought. And we'll show you how there is a, a, um, um, a friction about that when, when we talk in the week. That word offended is the Greek word scandalon, which, of course, we get the word scandal from. So, you know, so, so the problem is when, when most of us, particularly most evangelical Christians, really get a revelation of the real Jesus, it's a bit of a scandal because uh, he doesn't always fit the, uh, the model that we wanted him to fit. And we have to begin to see things somewhat differently. So, so if this is the truth about, about John, you know, he's... he's disillusioned, he's, he's in prison, he's, he's locked in, right, get that experience, he's in prison, he's locked in, he's disillusioned, he's offended, he's discontented, he's questioning everything, even the things he thought to be true about which he, he, he seemed certain, he's questioning all those, so what happened? What went wrong? Where? How? Why? What offended him? To quote another biblical analogy, and this might make sense for you, some of you. If you really look at the life of John, he tried to put new wine in an old wineskin. That never works for any of us. The, the, the old parable story is from the cultural reality of wine being in goatskins that uh, goatskins become old and brittle and inflexible. And if you try to put new wine, which ferments because it's alive, into those old brittle wineskins, 
then what happens is the uh, the wine skin will break, it'll burst, and you lose the skin and the wine. And sometimes I wonder if that is a very accurate picture of uh, of the church today, and uh, what is flowing in or or attempting to flow in, and whether we can be flexible enough to handle what it is that that new fermenting new wine of the real understanding of the kingdom of God and the Christ is all about uh, whether that breaks us rather than rather than we become a vehicle to transport that effectively um, that would suggest that renewal is an important element of life and uh, that inflexibility is a killer so just think about that um, the truth about the real Jesus is that Jesus came to get people out of the rut of religion and into the freedom of the fullness of life. Jesus never came to start another religion and in some ways it's rather sad that uh, such a large religion has grown out of this wonderful message and of course with all the distortions that that come along with that and sometimes I think we have missed the truth of of all that the Christ should be to us and in us and through us and in our communities uh, that maybe we have domesticated the Jesus of the Bible and we have institutionalized the, the process of what it means to follow him. Uh, so Jesus came to free us really from the root of our own ritual. We need freeing from that. The root of our own ritual. Some of you are very ritualistic. The rut of our own religion, uh, sometimes what we claim to be the thing that grew out of Jesus has become a religion of our own making or denominations making and it's become our rut that we like the like defending our trench. We're not going to let it be overrun, this is our trench, we dug this trench, this is our rut and it will become our grave. No, don't, no, we need to be free from the rut of our own religion. It's dangerous, it's scary, but we need to be need to be free from the rut of our own ridiculousness. Because the more I've looked at some of the things that I believed and just accepted, the more ridiculous they appear to be to me. Which I'm not going to talk about what those are today. But sometimes, you know, in in that in that inability to change, we become more and more ridiculous in what it is that we have held to and sound more ridiculous probably act more ridiculous. Uh, it came to free us from the rut of our resistance, which we are terrible at. I, I love the phrase that uh, uh, William Paul Young, who wrote The Shack, says. He says that in the group he was raised in, and mine was very, very similar, we were not raised to have a meaningful conversation. We were raised to, to defend a dogma. So we didn't know how to have a meaningful conversation. We only knew how to defend a dogma. That's called a rut. It's called a rut. And I have tried to learn and we have learned and um, continue to seek to learn how to have meaningful conversations with precious people about the journey that they are on and the wonderful essence of God, which is bigger than any of the... Uh, little temples that we have tried to build around him and uh, and contain him within. He will not be contained within that. And then there's the rut of our own self-righteousness. This is a big one, you know. <coughs> I am right because I say I'm right and I would feel insecure if I was shown to be wrong. So therefore, I will defend my rightness and I will live in the rut of my own self-righteousness that will again become your grave. And then there's the rut of our own bloody mindedness uh, about about what we have decided we believe. And uh, nobody's going to be permitted into that space to make us uncomfortable uh, uh, through challenge, which none of us really should fear. And we need to get out of that rut as well. You know, this time, just let me say this as I kind of wrap up today's talk, there should be no such thing as a new normal. Uh, I question whether there should even be a normal. I think, I think perceptions of normal are part of the problem of creating ruts, um, you know, which, which obviously become graves. So let me give you one last little thing before we shut off today. Uh, 
there is a principle called the principle of cell differentiation. It's something that occurs in a, in a pre-embryonic cellular, cellular state in the developing embryo um, of, of a child. Uh, let's use the human illustration. In that um, there is a point where in the division of the cells, all the cells are are equal and not distinct except that they are a division of the cell before them. But there comes a point in that uh, pre-embryonic development where, where those cells become positioned somewhere in what will be the body and wherever, that, this is a layman's simplified terms, wherever that cell, cell places itself determines what it becomes. So if that cell finishes up where the lung should be, it will become part of the lung. If the cell is where a liver should be, it'll become part of a liver. If the cell is where the eye should be, it'll become part of an eye. The point of this being that 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 um, that that the cell becomes whatever it is that will fill the space where it has positioned itself. So let, let me apply that to us in finishing. What you become is determined by where you position yourself in life. And the point at which you become rigid and inflexible is the point at which you lose the ability to change and become, and your rut becomes your grave. That's what I want you to grasp today. So I pray that faith and the desire for freedom will take you beyond familiarity and the fragile false security that it offers. And let me leave you with this wonderful little portion of scripture from Romans chapter 5 in the message. By entering through faith into what God has always wanted to do for us, set us right with him, make us fit for him, we have it all together with God because of our master Jesus. And that's not all. We throw open our doors to God and discover at the same moment that he has already thrown open his doors to us. We find ourselves standing where we always hoped we might stand out in the wide open spaces of God's grace and glory, standing tall and shouting our praise. That's rutless living. There's more to come. We continue to shout our praise even when we're hemmed in with troubles because we know how troubles can develop passionate patience in us and how that patience in turn forges the tempered steel of virtue, keeping us alert for whatever God will do next. In alert expectancy such as this, we never left feeling shortchanged, quite the contrary. We can't round up enough containers to hold everything God generously pours into our lives through the Holy Spirit. Christ arrives right on time to make this happen. Set your mind to be receptive rather than resistant so no rut can become your grave. We love you and I'll catch you again in the week.